own law problem. So I stay outside on, on Tuesday and worked at home because uh, Wi-Fi can <coughs> work out there. And I get a tan, so everyone thinks I've been holiday, but actually... Yeah, you look it. I work. was down in Northumberland, but I didn't get a tan. I'm afraid I'm Irish blue-white. I tell you, I had COVID, David. We had COVID. Right. Uh, we had COVID, my husband and I. Oh, no, I've and had he it was, as well. He was pretty ill, and I was... I would never have known. No, it's a horrible chesty version of it at the moment. Yeah, he's, um, he's he's got quite a bit of brain fog. He works at a high level and he's right. he's, he's not coping it. You know, it's very difficult for him. Well, close. Okay, folks, as far as I see, okay. we are live on Facebook. Okay, okay good so afternoon. Have a good everybody. afternoon. I'll catch you later. Thank you, Alan. Alan's got his hearing aids um, in today. <laughs> They're away from the bear. Um, welcome, David. Again, it's always our Favourite, favourite doctor. I get lots of nice uh, comments about you, Dave, which is lovely. Dave's on a time uh, limit today, everybody. So we want the question, questions. We've got some here. We're going to get through them as quickly as we can. I don't know how I nudge you on, David, but we'll do our best. I welcome everybody. We've got some people in the room, and I know we've got people on Facebook. And Linda's communicating with me in the background. Okay, David. Are you well, sir? I am. So before we start, uh, yeah. just... Uh, as always, there's going to be a request for help. Um, so uh, many, 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 many people on the call from the UK are part of the UK BBC cohort. Uh, people know it as the Cambridge Genetics Study run by George and colleagues. Um, and it has been instrumental in many of the changes in PBC over the last, um, you know, X number of years. Um, we are about to write out to everybody to ask them to complete another PBC 40. So um, the reason for that is twofold. One is um, you know, people have, have, have been asked to complete those before in, in UK PBC, but obviously the longer ago it is, the more you know, less relevant it may well be. Yeah. And this is about um, you know, understanding the impact of the condition as it is today. The other reason for it, which is very important, is that uh, we are in one of those quite extraordinary times at the moment where we have lots and lots of companies interested in new therapies for PBC. Mm -hmm. And 80% of them now are interested in symptom treatment, be it fatigue, <coughs> fatigue, brain fog and itch in all those areas. And so, <coughs> pardon me, I had COVID last week. Again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's extraordinary. And I can tell you that some of those drugs are extremely attractive, innovative ways of treating it. And so one of the reasons for us updating that information is to bring as many of those trials as we can to the UK so that people in the UK get the chance yeah. to participate in them. And so uh, it's a, a piece of research to help us, which is um, you know, following up where people have done it already in the UK PBC study, but but it's for a purpose as well, and that is, uh, and the the number one target at the moment for companies coming in is brain fog. Okay, so watch this space, Absolutely. and some of the drugs are very very exciting indeed, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, the information we can give them is about the scale of the problem. They want to know, is this really a problem? You know it's a problem. I know it's a problem. But to be able to show it's a problem, because basically we want companies to bring good drugs into PBC in the UK so that we can all find better treatments for every aspect of the disease. So that will land on people's door doormats um, in, in a month or so. So please do that. Can I come into our membership? Direct into our, our membership. It's for everybody who's in UK PBC. Um, so we'll so be mailing that to we'll be mailing our, it. our yeah. you you will have, well, we we have yeah. access to our membership to do <clears throat> so yes it's it'll be mailed out to people with a return envelope. So if people do get that, please do uh, fill it in. You'll be very familiar with the PBC 40, but it's it's both very important for understanding the problem, but it's also really important as part of the solution. Doesn't mean you know, and as always with trials it's entirely up to the individual whether it's right for them or, wh or whatever but we can only trial drugs if companies bring them to the UK and bring them forward in PBC and uh, that's where all the therapies that we have now have come from so that that's what that is we're putting together the news the beer facts at the moment maybe um somebody one of your, yes. your uh, staff yes. can give me a paragraph 
and yeah. then we need to work out the semantics. But please, please do it, everybody. The first yeah. time we did it, it was a fantastic success. It was brilliant. So let's go again. Yes, I mean, and, and the, the information we've got is is the most comprehensive in the world. I mean, yeah. that's what, in the particularly world. around symptoms. So because of the way in which everyone's participating in UK PBC, we have more information about symptoms in PBC in the UK than in anywhere else in the world, which yeah. has helped us to encourage companies to invest in this. Yeah. And because it costs a lot of money to develop drugs. And that means that therapies are coming along. And the big one, um, the big, big one is around brain fog in particular, because that's the one where we absolutely have nothing at the moment, but we are moving a pace with it. Yeah, it's exciting times, David. Right, moving on. Uh, background, I have PBC, EIH, have an itchy, an achy pain in my liver. This is worse when I lie, lie in it. I'm re re recently diagnosed, so I'm new to this. Any ideas of what it could be? Yeah, so so uh, people with PBC, so most liver disease, actually, your liver isn't painful. So um, people, mostly it isn't. Um, the liver has no nerves in it. Um, but it is surrounded by what we call a capsule, which is like a lining around it. Your liver is quite soft and mushy normally, um, which is why if you fall off a horse or, you know, hit on a gatepost or something, that's the famous injury. You can actually cause liver injury because it's quite soft in the capsule. Mm -hmm. But that capsule has nerves in the outside of it. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's why when you have a liver biopsy, if people have a liver biopsy, that's what's uncomfortable is where the needle goes through the capsule. It's not the liver itself. So in PBC, what happens is the liver swells a little bit. Um, so because of the effect of the bile not draining properly, it causes some irritation, the liver just swells. And that causes the capsule to stretch a little bit. Um, and that's what people feel as a sort of dull ache. Um, so it, um, <coughs> so it, it's a, that stretching phenomenon. And it's worse if you lie down because of the position. It can sometimes be a little bit worse if you breathe in because your, your liver moves when you breathe in. And it's just a bit of a sort of dull ache. Um, and in our experience, it tends to go away, you know, quite a lot with therapy. So it's one of the things that with us, so treatment and, you know, whatever treatment people take for overlap, uh, it will tend to improve because there's less swell swelling in the liver. The trap is that everyone thinks it's gallstone pain. Mm -hmm. um, and the the trap in the trap, if you like, is that gallstones are commoner in PBC than in similar, you know, age people in the population. So there is a, a slightly increased risk of gallstones, but the pain is quite distinct from gallstone pain. Gallstone pain is a much sharper one, much more of a squeezing pain rather than a dull ache. Okay. Um, and that will also tend to improve with ursa over the years. We see far fewer gallstone problems than we did. Yeah, so true. most people say, oh, it's gallstone pain. Um, you know, yeah. you should have your gallbladder out you know, take a, a, a step back. Mm -hmm. So what, what we always suggest with it, where people have got that, um, you know, it's nice to have an up-to-date ultrasound scan. That's part mm -hmm. of the routine workup anyway. Um, and if it if it looks and sounds like the PBC capsule pain, just treat as you would treat with PBC and you will find it will tend oh, to yes. go away over time. Yeah. But it, it's usual. And of course, everybody, and I'll say this because everyone worries about that, is whenever people get aches and pains like that, OK, everyone thinks is this cancer. Everyone does. And I, you know, there's no point in me saying they don't because they do. But remember, that's not normally painful in the liver for the reasons that I've said. So the, almost the one thing it isn't if you've got that dull ache is, is a cancer because that doesn't behave like that. That's almost always painless in the liver. Good, so, good, good. so it's it's to do with the PBC and the treat it, and the treatment is the correct treatment for PBC. But remember, it's just possible, particularly if you're new to to PBC, it could just be gallstones. Yeah. And and every once in a while, we have somebody have their gallbladder out, but it's not common yeah. at all. Okay. So similarly, on the on the subject of our soul, uh, I've been on our soul for about a month, and I've just started with quite bad nausea waves throughout the day. I take Urso in the evening about eight o'clock with food, so I don't know if it's the Urso or the liver itself. I'm also peeing a lot more and I have to admit that it's worrying me now and I'm still waiting for my follow-up appointment. Should I stop taking Urso or per Persevere? I would say before you answer, um, David's going to get through these quickly. If it's not enough information, give us a wee ring at the office and happy to chat things through and we can uh, do it another way. Right, David? 
so um uh you know the old saying a dog is not for christmas it's for life um and urso is is not just for today and tomorrow it's for life and yeah. so um it's not a drug that works very quickly it's not a drug that wears off very quickly but it's a drug you need to get used to ideally now the caveat is there is five percent of people who just can't take urso at the end of the day so we just need to be aware of that but most people can so what i would do in that situation so the first thing i would say is it's likely to be the urso because that's classic urso that sense of cockliness or sickliness is is classic urso um the peeing a lot isn't um and so therefore we need to just have half a thought as to what might be the causes for that so a water yeah. infection is commoner in pbc than than it would do be normally diabetes um isn't commoner in pbc but it's a it's something that happens in people who in the age spectrum of pbc so the peeing a lot um may just be you're noticing it more because you're worrying about things but it, it it's usually just check sugars and check a water specimen is, is the right way to do so what to do with the urso i wouldn't stop it what i would do is drop the dose right down and i would um therefore you know take a reduced dose if you're you know if it's if it's down to one tablet a day take a tablet alternate days and just build it up more slowly so what you're finding with a month is that is that you're now getting a highish dose of urso in the circulation and it's just causing that irritation so i would i wouldn't stop it i would just go to a lower dose and i would build it up slowly um in terms of food um remember that we look at the effectiveness of urso in terms of the blood tests at the end of it and so don't worry about with food without food evenings during the day um and, it, and it's useful to play around and find out if you if a particular time of the day is helpful or not um if you aren't seeing the effect that you'd want to see you know however you end up taking it then they'll increase the dose so um find a way that doesn't mean you're struggling to take it and if that you know that work out the interrelationship with food and basically timing and food find a way that you can take it and then stick with that and then the dose can be increased so and, and also you you can ask for a different uh, preparation of our so there's a few companies the one we prefer because we get to hear more success about is folk FALK folk uh foundation but you can ask about that as well um, yes. that, i've got a very quick question yes. here that's coming from linda and, I, and it's a kind of very quick one i'm going to throw in the middle here um, i'm 10 year post transplant fantastic with bilirubin levels fluctuating from 8 to 11 recent it was 12 should i be concerned no no brilliant okay done no um, <laughs> I was hoping to get back to work after caring for my parents at the end of their lives. At the time I was developing PBC symptoms without knowing, I have an appointment with an employment agency shortly to help me get back to work. I feel I could work circa three hours in the morning and it's not if it's not too stressful a job. I'm worried I might be making my PBC worse by pushing myself when exhausted. Also, should I let my future employer know that I have PBC? What I would say to this person, the one thing that the doctors all want us to do is have a normal a life is possible yes. Yes. and uh and we can talk about movement as medicine which it is we can go through that another time um what would you say to her david yes okay so it's a really good question so um yeah. I, I would echo that completely what you want to do is adjust the disease around your life not your life yeah. around the disease yeah. so um uh and uh being occupied um interacting in the outside world is a very important part so one of the things that we worry about a lot with people with symptoms is is social isolation people get cut off quite easily okay. um and so work is an important part of people's social life it's a you know and socializing is an important part of your social life so you are we, we really really encourage people not to rob peter to pay paul by cutting back on what you do it's a false yeah. economy yeah. um in terms of will you hurt yourself absolutely not um absolutely not um because remember you know movement is medicine is a term we use all the time but it is the the point about it is that you you get fitter by doing things it's the, the whole thing about movement and medicine is, is is exercise doesn't have to be wearing lycra and you know doing a marathon it's about doing more in your daily life but that trains you up mm -hmm. and so what you'll find is that if you if you start working it will hit you a little bit if you've not done it you'll be exhausted at the end of the day and you'll sleep but then next day, you know, the next week it will be easier. And so it, it, the right way to do is to work your way through it. 
So buy into more export. energy. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. David. But yeah. basically, we're buying into more energy, aren't we? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the, the other question is a bit more nuanced, which is what do you do about employers? So for people in a role at the moment, uh, in a role, um, there is a, and Colette will know far more about this actually than I do, um, but there are, there is a legal requirement to make necessary adjustments, appropriate adjustments to people's working conditions. So it is an obligation on your employer to listen to your health needs and make sensible adjustments and good employers will do that. And, and we sort of do a lot of advising companies about this and, and really good ones are really keen to find out what they can do and, and value people. And then, you know, it's about about valuing their workforce, and particularly at the moment where, where skilled people, you know, there's a real shortage of skilled people. Good employers will want to hang on to their people. Mm -hmm. And by and large, what you want to do with PBC is to work in mornings, not less afternoons and even less evenings and absolutely mm -hmm. not shift work. So, um, you know, the ideal way to work is kind of, you know, three quarters of a day starting in the morning because people often are much better in the morning and struggle a little bit towards the end of the day. So an existing employer, those are necessary, you know, appropriate adjustments, you know, reasonable adjustments to your working pattern. I think if you are going to an employment agency and just starting in that, I might be a bit more circumspect about that. What you don't want is any um, inappropriate you know, and ill, ill-informed negative biases coming in. Um, and we do know that people tend to not really understand liver disease, make assumptions about alcohol, et cetera, yeah, et cetera, absolutely. et cetera. So mm -hmm. with, with an agency like that, I, I wouldn't, I, I would keep it under the, uh, under your wing at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, as you get established into roles, people find out what you are and what you do then I think it becomes a more reasonable ask. But what you don't want to do is for people to kind of, you know, metaphorically close the folder before you've had a fair chance. Do you think, would you agree with that, Colette? Yeah, absolutely. There, there used to be something called the Disability Discrimination Act, and yes. that changed in, in 2010, I think it was, to the Equalities Act. Yes. Now, we've had a legal uh, article in our bare facts. So this person, we can let you have that article, a <coughs> website, but if you could phone the office after we yeah. finish this today, 01 T1556 yeah. then we can arrange to have the legal our, our legal interpretation uh, sent to you. Over the years, we have had really brilliant buy-in from employers, you know, yeah. who just yeah. want to know what they can do. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, fantastic I said, examples of it. I said to my employers, don't you know I've got PBC, so they put a couch next to my desk so I could lie down if I wanted to. Not that I thought they cared, one jot. Right, thank you. <laughs> uh, I have read there's a link to developing autoimmune disease such as PPC with early trauma. This is a really interesting one. I'm interested as I went away to boarding school, my seventh birthday, oh bless, and then only saw my parents in school holidays. Do you think for some people, the body internalizes trauma, which then affects them later in life and can trigger conditions such as PPC? This is interesting, David, because I've got, I started off the conversation, a friend um, had cancer, but her, she lost her 17 year old son to heart attack, at, you know, a few months beforehand. This is not just PBC. I hear this a lot about lots of diseases, a car crash, sudden yeah. death, you know, some kind of trauma. Um, it does get talked about, but I don't know if there's any evidence to support it. With yes. So, so it's a very interesting area. And yeah. um, the, uh, there's a whole field uh, of science called neuroimmunology and psychoimmunology. So neuroimmunology is the interaction of the immune system and the brain. Psychoimmunology is, you know, the interaction between immunology and psychological states. OK, so this is a very live area and people are very aware of it. Now, at a physical level, you know, if you have a car crash, for example, your body produces huge amounts of you know adrenaline huge amounts of steroids and those things will all disrupt the immune system okay and the immune system operates on checks and balances so the immune system has actions and inact has activating and inactivating things so everything it's it's not passive it isn't switched on and off it is usually in a state of on but regulated so the analogy i always use it's a little bit like a car where the accelerator is being pressed but so is the brake so you know a car and it's not moving but that's not the same as the engine being off 
People mm -hmm. then think the engine is off with the immune system. It isn't. It's often on and somebody's got their foot on the accelerator, but the brake is more firmly pressed. And so anything that comes along and disturbs that balance can unleash this type of thing. So um, personally, I think traumatic events absolutely can trigger it. OK, um, and I think uh, I think, you know, I, it's not easy to understand how that information helps you, because obviously in life we want to avoid traumatic events anyway. Mm -hmm. But I think it undoubtedly can do. I think you just have to watch out because it, you you can have what's called ascertainment bias. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that um, and I'm going to show my age now, uh, but coming from the northeast, um, um, people remember Brendan Foster, the the runner. Um, yeah, you you do. You know, he won the only athletics Olympic medal in 1976 for the, the UK. And Brendan Foster was a great runner, set up the Great North Run, but he was a one paced runner. And we'll all remember. I remember watching Grandstand. You know, I'm showing my age, but there he would he would set off in a race, 10,000 meters, and and he'd be a lap ahead. Mm -hmm. And he would just get caught at the end because he could mm. laugh at that pace all day long, but he mm. couldn't accelerate. And so he was one paced. And so PBC patients, in my experience, are a bit one paced, mm. is that you can find a way of coping with the day to day, this and that and the other. You can cope with all of that and find a way to be able to do it. But all of a sudden, when something comes along that puts an extra stress on you, you struggle. Mm. So. For example, a you know child being ill or a parent or a road traffic accident, people often don't have the capacity. They're like Brendan Foster. They don't have the capacity to step up. They don't have the energy to be able to really go into overdrive to deal with those things. And so sometimes the condition can, can be apparent in those situations. It's not it hasn't been triggered by it, mm -hmm. but it's manifested itself as part yeah. of it. There is a really, you know, interesting whole strand of, of 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 immunology there was a very famous study with students and uh, where they they were all um going to come and take part in a imaging study or something like that um and it was a, a psychology experience you can't do these any you have to be honest with people with what you're doing but what they actually did was got all these students in and said look oh really sorry it's, there's going to be a delay you know there's a problem with the scanner um so is it okay if we if we play a film you know just just to you know fill the weight while you're waiting but what we'll actually do is we'll, we'll start collecting the tears that were going to be collected as part of this you know just so it, at least we're started of course the study was to look at the immune response in tears um before and after different films and so one group got a horror film one film got a you know romantic film and wow. so on um, and their immune response was different in those different situations just simply on the basis of the film that they watched so a sad film had a different mm -hmm. immunological response to a to a romantic film mm -hmm. and a comedy so the, the emotions impact on the way the immune system works mm -hmm. and any doctor will tell you any doctor will tell you that you there are people who want to fight conditions there are people who give up fighting conditions we talk about people who turn their face to the wall um, who give up with chronic illness and and it has a real impact so the ability of your mindset to control disease is absolutely real mm -hmm. um, and it's a very important thing and it's, it's why now, one of the mantras that we talk about all the time is there are two kind of memes. My, my kids tell me about memes all the time. So I'm going to talk about memes now. No idea what they are, but, <laughs> um, but, but they seem to be kind of cliches. But there are two, one which we'll use again and again and again. One of his movement is medicine. Um, but the other is um, own the problem, own the solution. And I think that's why owning your mm -hmm. problem set, mm -hmm. understanding it, accepting it, and coming up with your plan, develop with people like the foundation and you know ourselves. Mm -hmm. But you own the solution because you own the problem, and that's, that's about yeah. you can change what's happened. What's it was gone? A very on. famous psychology experiment in a in a old people's home, and it had two distinct wings. And in one wing, everyone in the old people's home was given a pot plant. Okay. And um, in one wing, they were told, that's your pot plant to look at. We'll water it. You know, we'll look after it for you. In the other wing, they were told, it's your pot plant. You have to look after it. You have to water it. You have mm -hmm. to take care of it, um, you know, mm -hmm. because it's important. And actually, there was a survival advantage in the people who looked after their own pot plant. It sounds extraordinary. But owning 
your world is a really important part because you, yeah. you know it, it may not be perfect but it's my version of you know it's my you know i have found my way through it so we do a lot of work with people on own the problem own the solution and this comes um beautifully into the next question because I'm, i've got five pence to see on this as well and That's this not way, like you, Claire. <laughs> I like to think what we're going to see is valuable. But it won't be after Scottish independence. It'll be five we're Scottish. Quiet. We're not having independence. independence. I thought, I, I thought I'd get my Scottish independence. Told a load of lies. I, I notice you've not got a mask on. I gather it, I, I I thought it was something you had to do in Scotland. Unless well, you're used it on Monday, this silly group of Right, right. I'll, I'll, I'll stay off that. That's politics. <laughs> I know, I'll get into real trouble. And uh, fatigue is such a hard to, thing to explain and share with others. Now, this person asks, can you please give me some advice on how to explain it to family and working colleagues, how it might affect you? Now, this is a good question. Now, I don't know if uh, David remembers this, but one of our uh, medical advisory team, Professor Newberger, many years ago had hepatitis. And uh, he said the tiredness, fatigue, heaviness, he says there wasn't a word to describe it. That did, it did, he, did you hear him talk about this? It was really interesting. And he's right, because you could say yeah. many of these things holding you know you're holding a hair dry i know you don't do very often david is is quite difficult you know <laughs> but equally equally i cycled 25 miles and climbed a thousand feet last weekend i built up to it i worked towards it but what i would say to you to this person and you can tell me what you think because i know you you've got the clinic you've got the speciality the only one in the world um right where you're working is that Use the information that we have to show your family, but equally, use your own words to describe yes. it. Yes. They, 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 as David says, you walked into that beautifully. You own this. You yes. have this. Your fatigue is probably different from mine. It's different from James Newberger's, whatever. You own it. You describe it. Yes. And if somebody says, well, you know, you look well. I like looking well. I like when people tell me I look well. That That's happy days. I don't want to look unwell and tired and what have you. But if there's a, a measure of disbelief, yeah. that's their problem and not yours. You work it around you. David, do you, you want to add to that? I'm sure. <coughs> I, I've not told anybody this, but actually I uh, have quite high blood pressure. I, I can't imagine why. Um, <laughs> Me too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, running around like a, a lunatic all the time. And, mm. and, and I, at one stage, got added in additional blood pressure treatments. Um, and it completely and utterly wiped me out. And I couldn't walk around the supermarket. I remember sitting by the freezer in Tesco's on the floor because I couldn't walk another mm -hmm. step. Now, we think that type of fatigue is part of what you get in fatigue. It's to do with perfusion of the muscles and things like that. But it was this all enveloping. It, words couldn't describe it. But I just had to sit down, this all enveloping, being mm -hmm. smothered by it. So uh, absolutely, um, it, it's it's very difficult now the one thing that isn't useful is to give it a number you know my fatigue score is seven out of ten mm -hmm. because that assumes that somebody knows what fatigue is um and it assumes that they know what seven out of ten significance would be mm -hmm. and of course one of the things that people always do is that they will con compare their their experience of fatigue with what you're describing so itch is slightly different because most people don't itch and so therefore people accept that that's unique and different in people with pbc um whereas fatigue everyone gets tired um you know slept badly whatever so you know in what ways what you're experiencing different to me it's profoundly different so it, it's like um I always say it's a, a fatigue score is like a blood pressure. Everybody has one. It's mm -hmm. the question is whether it's abnormal or not. And actually, mm -hmm. the truth as to whether it's abnormal or not is whether it's normal for you. Mm -hmm. But unless you've measured it before a problem arose, you don't know. So as Colette said, numbers aren't that useful. An abstract concept mm -hmm. words like fatigue aren't aren't that useful because it assumes that everyone means the same thing. So I think it is those descriptive words that are really important. I think we the, there are um, several things that you know people have said to me over the years. That's where the brain fog comes from. That that's you can talk about cognitive impairment and cognitive dysfunction, things like that, and, and people glaze over. But brain fog, everyone everyone can can understand. You know, you're having to actively think your way through something. 
It feels like the batteries have run out. You know, that's another one that everyone can relate yeah. to. Somebody said it yeah. feels like I've run a half marathon, but I only walked up the stairs. That's another yeah. one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Somebody said to me recently, it's like it's like walking through treacle. Um, uh, or, 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 or also, somebody's also said it's like trying to think your way through treacle. Okay. <laughs> Um, which I think is very is very yeah. powerful, and mm -hmm. then the other one is it. I feel like I'm walking up a down escalator, mm -hmm. um, that everything is just harder work. And I think those words are very powerful. I think people can relate to those. And I think it's one of those situations where um, where words are useful and being honest with what you want and need. Most people, in my experience, most people don't understand but want to mm -hmm. and a small number of people do understand um, and a smaller group of people still don't care and don't understand and don't care mm -hmm. so most people they don't really get this because they don't understand it um, uh, so so that's why explaining it in ways that people can understand is important and actually go back to the work comment mm -hmm. in fact what what people usually want is not to have a you know couch next to their desk but they <laughs> want people to realize that there will be the odd occasion when I'm yeah. really struggling so well, just accept that uh, yeah. you know you know me I work hard I do what I do yeah but just for reasons that I can't explain I'm gonna have bad days just so you know about it and just mm -hmm. a little bit of flexibility and understanding that's what people want yeah. what that's I do that's... know is that people's fear of that happening is actually part of the problem so a group that i found for example often struggle with this are teachers and the reason is rigidly timetabled mm -hmm. so actually um you know you're teaching that horrible you know group of 13 year old boys at two o'clock on a thursday it could be that you're you know really struggling at two o'clock on a thursday and that's a problem mm -hmm. but actually it's the fact that you're terrified all the way through wednesday and thursday morning it's going to happen that's so right. fear of it becomes a problem but if you've got a mitigating strategy well you know fine if you can't do it we'll mm -hmm. step up sort it out you know yeah you know, we're, we're cool with that actually takes away the fear of it and that's mm -hmm. where you're you are owning you have a solution mm -hmm. to it and that that's yeah. right so be very clear what you don't want from people you don't want them to yeah. rub you in cotton wool and feel sorry yeah. for you you yeah. want them to understand and say you know if i tell you i'm going to bed this afternoon just live with it you know uh, yeah. It. yeah absolutely um, there's a comment which is really interesting is that yeah i was just about to come to that it says yeah, interesting yeah, yeah. That a lot of people post covid talk about fatigue and brain fog and have an inkling of it and you know, i was saying to david before we came live and uh, my husband and i had covid just a few weeks ago yeah. and my husband's a very fit man he can cycle 100 he comes down to newcastle on his bike he's been really hit hard i wasn't i was fine but his brain <coughs> he, he didn't remember yesterday how much porridge he puts in the thingy to make yeah. for himself just he, silly things his brain fog and, and he, he's a highly intelligent individual um, you know, he's got a PhD in mathematics and what have you, but it is affecting people. It absolutely, yeah. absolutely is. Yes. So the um, so I, I think it's fascinating. So yeah. it is the convergent use of the terminology. So you're absolutely right. Um, it's a really interesting point. So it was that people in that world came, arrived at the terminology brain fog. They're not picked it up from anybody like us. Yeah. So. And it, it is, you know, it is the words to describe what's going on. And I think the richness of the language people use it tells you so much. So fatigue, you know, PBC patients get fatigue. Well, you know, that doesn't tell you very much. But the two sorts of fatigue are my batteries are running down and I get brain fog. Instantly, those words have started to identify different type, what we call endotypes, yeah. different types of fatigue that will need different treatments. So I think the words are very powerful. And when different people from different directions end up with the same words, that tells you something. Absolutely. Now, this is literally hot off the press because it only happened yesterday. But we did a study 15 years ago now um, where we did a thing called transcranial magnetic stimulation, where we looked at people's brains and the ability to respond to a magnetic stimulus. So you, you give a magnetic pulse to somebody's brain and then you give them another pulse and the brain adapts in between times. OK, mm -hmm. and it's a way of looking at brain function. Um, and we did a study, one of those studies we did, and we never 
it was quite striking what we found that there was an abnormality in brain function but we didn't at that stage understand it because nobody really understand what it meant other than it was wasn't normal we did it as a one-off study 15 years ago um and about a year or so ago um about a year or so ago um people discovered that uh, what it was caused by was an an over uh, uh, an excess level of a sense so i think called gaba um which is um which is uh gamma butyric acid it's a brain signaling molecule but it was higher it's higher in the in the brains of people showing that pattern so it, and, and it switches your brain function down so that kind of makes sense um and about a year ago people showed that actually that pattern we'd shown on the brain stimulation studies was caused by high levels of GABA okay and yesterday somebody got in touch who dug out this old paper who's done that exact study in long COVID and in long COVID they have exactly the same pattern and they were fascinated by what that was so I can tell you long COVID in terms of brain physiology behaves just the same as brain fog in PBC very interesting because the words are the same and just to complete the circle just if people aren't excited enough there is a trial that we are hoping to launch fairly shortly, and Colette's very familiar with this. This is the Umacrine Golexanolate. Yeah, 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 yeah. This drug blocks GABA overactivity, okay? So for the first time, we are heading towards a drug that blocks the thing that we actually think causes the brain fog. Mm -hmm. So the PVC, for whatever reason, causes your brain to produce too much of this switching off chemical and what this drug does is it switches off the off switch if you like which is a de facto on switch it may not work we'll see but boy is it this space can i just add david you mentioned a couple of things there you've talked about blood pressure and we've talked about covid now listen everybody as far as i know everybody in the uk with liver disease was sent a letter by the nhs even we got one in scotland to say that if you were uh, diagnosed with so a PCR test with COVID, you would be entitled to a particular type of antivirals. Now, please research this because if you're, you've got to have it within five days of, of your symptoms. But the one that I was offered, they, they said to me, the, the, the consultant said to me, if you're on blood pressure tablets, you would need to come off them for eight days. We had a good chat about it. I didn't have bad symptoms. I didn't come off my blood pressure tablets. So what I want to say to everybody out there, if you got offered this medication, you have to make a phone call. Make sure you tell them everything about your medical history, not just your PVC. Tell them everything. And if you're unsure, one of the most underused disciplines in this in the world, I think, are um, pharmacists. So yeah. always check with the pharmacists. They, ex they know exactly what's what with all of these medications uh, we, we, we touched on this before in one of these yeah. sessions is absolutely yeah. absolutely use pharmacists and this is not yeah. the people behind the counter all pharmacies when open dispensing drugs will have a pharmacist and they are very they go through a, a, a qualification process not dissimilar to doctors yeah. and yeah. that they so th there'll be the dispensers who issue the prescriptions but there will always be a pharmacist there and they're always happy and uh, as i said before if you go into any pharmacy you'll actually notice there is a quiet room always a quiet room so they'll they'll take you and have a chat with you and I couldn't agree point, more it's a massively underused resource and they're the ones who really understand about drug interactions that's right. Right, we're going to be really quick now because they're hammering it. How does our stuff actually work in the treatment of PBC? That is a quite a lengthy explanation. Um, maybe it's something we could write about, David. What do you think? Yes, it, it, yes. It, the short answer is that there is there are active treatments and passive treatments. So what Urso does is it's a passive treatment. So basically in PBC, for whatever reason, you produce too much of a bile acid, which is harmful, okay? So your bile acid pool changes, you produce too much of a bile acid that causes damage to the bile duct. So that's what happens. And Urso, what it does is displaces that. So it, it, it's inert, but basically if you take enough Urso, it kicks out the other stuff. And so there's less of the other stuff. So it's an inactive effect. So it's a passive, di it's like diluting, you know, orange squash, if you like. Um, it just dilutes it. Mm -hmm. um, 
Drugs like bezafibrate and abeticolic acid are active. They actively switch off the production of bile acids, and that's why they're more effective. So Urso, um, there is a certain level of activity of the disease that just diluting isn't going to be enough. Um, you know, if it's so concentrated, then you need to have something a little bit more. And of course, that's why the combination of Urso and a drug like abeticolic acid is very logical, because mm. at one level, you, you reduce the amount that's produced, and the other level, you they dilute just, what is there. So yeah. they act together. That's yeah. why we use the two. Okay, great. Right. This is a very, very good question here. I have an appointment with my consultant next week, so I'm glad we can get this in now, David. I'm keen to go with questions and help understand my PVC better. Don't ever hesitate to contact us. Should I ask about my blood test results and ask about how the results made different from before? Are there any certain numbers or levels I should ask about? Well, there are. Your, your ALP is important. But always, if you want to run your blood test, the doctor will give them to you. Yes. Um, so ask for them, get them to send them to you once your blood's been taken. But you are entitled to see everything to do with your medical records. Um, so, David, um, should I ask about my blood results? Yes. How about the results may be different from before? Well, this is where they look at trends, though, don't they? Look yeah. at the, over a, a period of time. And in yeah. particular, the ALP and the bilirubin, would, would you agree with that? Yes. So, <clears throat> so basically, your questions, the questions are... Uh, am I, where am I in the spectrum of risk? So as I go into the room, am I low risk or medium risk or high risk? So how high risk am I? 90% of PVC patients are low risk, okay? And then the other question is, am I on the right treatment at the right level? So am I, am I enough treatment, enough of what I am taking, or is there anything else I need to take? And if you think about it, there, that, that, that's like a grid of you know two by two, isn't it? So there are people who are low risk and high risk, and there are people on low therapy and high therapy. And what you need to do is make sure that you're in the right, you know, in the right place for you. So people with high risk disease need high therapy. People with low risk disease need low therapy. And you just want to avoid a mismatch between them. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, the, the the what it boils down to is bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase. Bilirubin is the jaundice chemical. And so it builds up when the liver isn't working or the bile duct isn't working. So mm -hmm. lower is better. And um, a lady before asked about a bilirubin value of, of 12 and 8 after a liver transplant. Anything yeah. up to 20 is normal. Yeah. And uh, it reflects what you've eaten and, you know, so on. So don't worry Next about it. can fluctuate. Yeah, yeah. You, know, yeah. you get a lot of noise with it. So you want yeah. that number to be normal, okay? So a question is, is my bilirubin normal? And that's a yes or no, right? And we'll come back to what you do with that information in a second. Alkaline phosphatase is a bit more complex because you are, there are really three states you can be in. Um, that there is a group of people where the value is too high, okay? And that's when it's above 210, 200 to 210, okay? There is also normal, which is below 130. Um, and then there is the in-between. So we tend to talk about them as red, red, amber, and green. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Traditionally, people were looking for it to be green or amber. Um, so is my alkaline phosphatase below 210, yes or no? If it's yes and the bilirubin is below 20, yes, then that's low risk. Increasingly, we're going to push that to being normal. So actually, it's only green and green. So bilirubin, it's red and green. Alphos is amber, red and green. And basically, green and green is fine. Any red is bad. And basically, green and amber is probably OK, but we're going to do it. So basically, is my bilirubin normal? Is my alkaline phosphatase below 210? And if it is below 210, is it normal? Okay. If either of those is not true, then the question is, what are you going to do about it? Okay. Because not doing anything about that is no longer acceptable. Okay. Um, NICE, you'll be very clear, you know, everyone's heard of NICE. Um, NICE are very clear that second line therapy should be made available to all patients who do not respond adequately to ERSO. Okay. And so therefore, it's perfectly reasonable not to take second line therapy. But that's your decision. It's not your doctor's decision. It's not the NHS's decision. It's your decision. And there are pros and cons, but you should be involved in a discussion about whether it's the right thing for you. So about 
thirty percent of people don't end up taking second line therapy in our clinic. About a, half the rest take ochre. About half the rest take visafibrate. So, and it is driven entirely by whether your bilirubin is above twenty and whether your alkaline phosphatase is above, um, you know, two hundred and ten. So those are the numbers that really matter. And if you've got either of those above the level you want, the question is not um, is what are you going to do about it and what are my options and ask that explicit question. The one caveat about bilirubin is, without getting too complicated, it can vary in individuals. And there's a thing called Gilbert's syndrome, um, where, <clears throat> which isn't even a syndrome, it's a variant of normal, where you run a higher bilirubin level. It's just because your bilirubin doesn't get passed out as effectively into the bile yeah. duct. Yeah. And you can have a value up to about 50 with that. Um, and just to make it even more complex, and it's totally normal, it has no, it's not an abnormality at all, it's just normal for you. Um, and the real complication is that that number can go up when you're unwell. So you can have somebody who's got, you know, COVID or something and the bilirubin yeah. goes up. Mm -hmm. And then everyone then thinks they've got liver disease. So it's the real wild card. And it's why you shouldn't put everything in the, everything on bilirubin levels. We've certainly been referred people for transplantation who um have a bilirubin of 50 and otherwise their blood tests are normal and it's just they got gilberts and so it's a massive trap that all liver doctors know about but just if you have got a high bilirubin if it's normal for you it's normal for you it's trends as colette says yeah. it's a rise in these things over time that's important and obviously if you've got fatigue or itch that's for you to tell the doctor about yeah. and again if you've got itch the next question is is it bad enough to want to take a tablet for it a lot of people it isn't but you know, you want to have it recorded and then fatigue, um, you know, is about supportive management. So if you've got symptoms, again, what can you do to help with my symptoms? And do not let your doctor off the hook. OK, Absolutely. do not let your doctor off the hook. Yeah. OK, I've got two more questions for you, uh, David. We can go a couple of minutes over. I think I, I've got five minutes of wriggle room. OK, now this is a good question. Is, is, is monitoring GGT necessary in PVC? Is it significant? Now, before the doctor gives you the medical explanation of that, most people that I know of with, with um, PVC do get the GGT, uh, your gamma GT uh, looked at. But, 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 you know, we've just come through two years of lockdown and COVID and everything else, and people have had different lifestyles. And this can increase with weight gain, which can cause fat in the liver and we're not fat shaming here at all but you know a lot of people have put on weight um over this really difficult period and that is something that can affect the the gamma gt the weight gain itself i mean there's things you can do about it and we can talk about that that's for another time but please do contact me anybody and we can um and we can help in that way but you know to have fatty liver disease and pbc is not great so I'm going to let you comment. Um, yeah, so gamma GT is a, like a yeah. variant of alkaline phosphatase, um, and it's the less useful version of it. And the reason it's less useful is, as Colette says, um, it can be put up by other things that alkaline phosphatase mm -hmm. isn't. So there's a lot of noise in it. And the other thing is it can go up and down very rapidly. So, mm -hmm. so it's just not as useful. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing is that there is a belief set amongst GPs that it's, it's only put up by alcohol, which is nonsense. And so it then instantly, you know, goes into a discussion about how much you're drinking. So we, in fact, don't routinely measure gamma GT because it creates a lot of noise around it. Its main use is alkaline phosphatase itself is, is very useful in PVC, but it can be produced by your bones. So if you have a teenage child, um, their alkaline phosphatase will be twice or three times yours. And the reason is because it's pumped out by growing bone and a, a, a number of bone conditions like Paget's disease and things like that can have very high ALK-FOS levels. Mm -hmm. So you do just have to be careful if you've got some of the high ALK-FOS. Don't say it's liver until you know it's liver because it, you'll, you'll miss something else. Now, usually it is, but occasionally you can be trapped. And there are two ways to answer that question. One is you can do what's called an isotype. So you can actually measure the liver type of ALK-FOS and the bone type. So that will tell you which it is. But a far simpler way of doing that is gamma GT. So if you've got a raised alk -fos and a raised gamma GT, it's liver, chances are. And if you've got a raised alk -fos and your gamma GT is normal, then it's bone. And that's the only time we ever measure a gamma GT. Once you know what's going on in a diagnosed BBC, we never measure it again. 
Okay, I get mine done every time I hate to tell you. But anyway, I'm, but I've it's been getting yeah. done for 20 odd years. So different I, people, yeah. you know, different. Uh, the, the other thing, is, the other thing is, it's, it, 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 it poses more questions than it answers. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a test that ends up with you doing other tests, which get yeah. back you to where you were before you did the gamma GT. <laughs> Yeah, I think they just do it. I, I don't think anybody thinks about it. It's a routine thing. They just do what. The well, a lot of. I mean, yeah. actually, to be honest, our hospital it's not on the routine liver blood test panel, so yeah. I can order it. Um, but I have to order it. I have to tick a box for it. Whereas in a lot of hospitals, it's done routinely as part. Yeah, of the we, routine. Okay, I suffer from acid reflux. Oof. Uh, take two 20 milligrams of meprazole each day. Could this be an enemy connected to the PBC? No. And I've got one more question after that, so no. you keep your eye on the clock. Reflux, not common, um, common uh, it's, um, uh, it's worth treating it because you don't want to get irritation in the lower gullet. So um, the, the proton pump inhibitors, uh, omeprazole and things, are one of the, people tend to forget it, but they are one of the revolutionary treatments in my clinical lifetime. Mm -hmm. So, you know, before the advent of these drugs, we used to see people with umpteen, you know, bleeds from ulcers and ulcer surgery and mm -hmm. horrible things. And these drugs have transformed it. The only thing to say about them is that uh, you need to take as much as you need to take. So um, the body does get used to them a little bit. And sometimes, sometimes people say, oh, you know, you, you've got 20 milligrams of omeprazole, but you've still got reflux. Well, you need to take more. I mean, your body is telling you you need to take some more. Um, the, the one to watch out for omeprazole, ironically, was the very first of these drugs. And actually, it's in many ways the best um, because it doesn't interact with food and with antacids. So a lot of times people take antacids as well um, to give a sort of temporary top up. But a, drugs, a lot of drugs like lansoprazole and pantoprazole, things like that, they bind to uh, they bind to antacids, bind to food. Oh, so you really? have to be careful about when you take them. And ironically, omeprazole, which was the first, is the one that doesn't do that. Um, Gosh. So just um, so omeprazole, you can take it any time of the day and it works fine. If you're taking the other drugs, you need to take them on an empty stomach first thing in the morning. Interesting. Right. Last question. I have cirrhosis and I also take azathioprine. I last had a blood test and ultrasound in October. I have an appointment to see my consultant in July, which is a nine month break. Is this safe or okay? So the... Uh, so yes is the yes is the yes with a caveat is the a short answer. So azathioprine, so let's unpick the various different bits of that. So azathioprine uh, is is a very safe drug taken long term. Um, and you don't actually need to keep checking blood tests ultra frequently with it. People often end up doing that. Um, it causes reduction in the white blood cell count that's its problem but that tends to happen when you start it or when you increase the dose so when people are in a steady state and are on the same dose they've been for a long period of time then actually it becomes less important to monitor the blood test more frequently so so nine months it so depends where you are in the sequence the way you are in the sequence with azathioprine so if you've been on that dose for five years then that that's fine and actually we over monitor people so it's very unusual to develop new problems if the dose hasn't changed um, and the formulation hasn't changed um, to, with regard to cirrhosis um, people with cirrhosis should be getting an ultrasound scan every six months and should be getting um, endoscopy um, for varices once a year ideally now most centers don't do it that frequently because it can feel a lot like overkill. But um, you need to be having both of those at least annually. So technically, it should be every six months. But realistically, it becomes quite burdensome for people. Mm -hmm. My, so, so yes, nine months is all right. But it needs to have those things followed up, blood tests checked, you know, looking for complications. Very important for, for azathioprine. Very important. Its risk factor is viral infections, which can cause skin cancer. So check your skin and also cervical cancer. So very important to have you know, smears, et cetera, if that's appropriate. So mm -hmm. um, so those are the things to watch out for with azathioprine. My only question mark is what is this is a PBC call and and we wouldn't normally use azathioprine in PBC. We would use it in people who genuinely had overlap. Um, mm -hmm. 
because it's the standard maintenance therapy for autoimmune hepatitis. So if somebody's got autoimmune hepatitis or overlap, then it's a very reasonable thing to do. There was a vogue for using it in PVC a number of years ago, but it's it's not something we would do anymore. So not knowing anything else about the story at all, uh, just check why you're taking azathioprine because it, it, it needs to be for a reason. And one of the things that we do know, there'll be lots of people on this call who've had they've been through this journey of reevaluating overlap. There was a tendency to, to give people the label of PVCIH overlap in the past. Um, and um, it, most of those people, in fact, don't have overlap. It, 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 it's a very long winded story, but most of them actually have bad PVC. So the, the question is whether what additional therapy do you need beyond Urso? And actually, it often isn't azathioprine and steroids. It's actually a beta colic acid or bezofibrate. Mm -hmm. And so anybody who's on azathioprine, anybody who came to our clinic on azathioprine, um, we would we would look into why are they taking it? Is it a legacy treatment that maybe isn't necessary anymore, or is it is it still the right thing to do? Chances are it's the right thing to do, but you know we never stop asking the questions. Is it sometimes given for uh, rheumatoid arthritis? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, there are plenty of other reasons why people would take azathioprine. So yeah. it's a standard treatment in rheumatoid. It's a standard treatment in inflammatory bowel disease. So those are absolutely you know, perfectly good reasons to do it. And we we see lots of people inevitably who've got mm. you know particularly joint disease mm. and one of the things that's very important is um to know who is driving the train okay mm. <laughs> um and this sometimes gets lost um so what will often come across is somebody and the rheumatologist think they're taking the azathioprine for the liver and the liver doctors think they're taking the azathioprine for the joints so it's we always clarify with our colleagues who, who is overseeing which therapy okay mm -hmm. so it, mm -hmm. you, know, you always look for a therapy that will treat both elements so for example if you've got autoimmune hepatitis and rheumatoid arthritis azathioprine is a very good treatment because it covers both but one of them should be watching the dose one of them should be watching the. so it, it's just you know important to know who is overseeing that Mm -hmm. And just therefore, it, it, it's the classic trap for how you end up on something too long is if everyone thinks that somebody else is watching it. Absolutely. You've uh, broken a record, David. What? We're done. We're done. No more questions. <laughs> no more questions. No, no I'm going to ask you. I'm not having you late. Uh, thank you very much for a very uh, form to session uh, from Caroline. That's great. Well, so a couple of things, everybody. Will you please, please think about sending us donations because we get nothing from governments, any of them. And um, we only have some uh, donations coming in from the longest standing members. So please give us what you can. And secondly, thank you. Most of you will know that I am now standing down as Chief Executive of the Foundation and get a bit of a life back. But I will be in the background somewhere doing something. I am not not accessible if anybody needs me. But... And um, hopefully uh, within the next few months, you'll have a new CEO and uh, you'll all be well looked after. I can I can promise you that uh, we've got a great team of doctors. Uh, yeah, you're such a natural at comparing these sessions. You know, <laughs> you can't possibly be allowed to. You're the sort of, you know, you're the Jeremy Kyle of the. <laughs> well, um, do you know, I actually said to, to uh, one of my staff, I said, you know, the one thing when I stand down, I want to do the two o'clock. So then yeah, one yeah, yeah. came off and I said, do you know what? I'm exhausted. I've got to go lie down now. Uh, you know, just, just for everybody. And I think, um, you know, I speak for literally everybody that, you know, to say, you know, to Colette when she does stand down, thank you for everything that you have done. And what you have done has been utterly immense for oh. the patients and for all of us. I mean, immense. Um, you wrote the book on how to do this. Um, but I'm sure you won't go away completely right. I mean, it's a bit like James. Well, I mean, well, quietly. <laughs> James has retired many times um, and it doesn't seem to affect the, the extent to which he gets involved in things. But do pick and choose the things that are valuable. These sessions, no, it's something we've all discovered about ourselves, which is that mm. <clears throat> certainly some of my colleagues hate doing these. I mean, not hate, the, the but are nervous about it feel very uncomfortable and I do think there are some people who just feel comfortable doing that and, and you're very comfortable doing it Robert oh, I love you're it. very I comfortable love it. doing I, it I, I think I'm pretty there. comfortable and, and you Dave <laughs> and you yeah you know that's all communicators David and I are going to be in London on the 23rd of June at the same symposium 
I mean, we'll all have, <laughs> we'll have a ball. We'll have a great time. You know, um, and I think it's it's about being comfortable with yeah. it all. So I yeah. do think, yeah. I, you know, it goes back to something I've said. It's been a horrendous two years for everybody. But there are some things that have come out from this yeah. that actually are incredibly useful. And this is one of them. Is it will ne- I don't think we'll ever go back to not doing this type of thing because it, it's just been... And uh, as you, as everyone can tell, we all enjoy doing this immensely. Um, it is the yeah. thing I look forward to in the month more than anything else, actually, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, because it's talking, you know, to to people. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's what I do and what you all care about, and you know, so it's not a burden for any of us. Is the point I'm making? And, and, and you know, well, when with I started, that mind, Dave, I'll be sending out the July and August opportunities very <laughs> shortly. Yeah, I, I would say it, I would remind people when I first started this, I started this because of a need, because no patient had anything, no PPC person in the world had any information on PPC. Yeah, and you were lucky to get to see a PPC specialist. They were very, very sparse. There was no internet in those days. Think about that. I was the internet, David. It's like yeah, still yeah. Having... So I'm thank you for your, your lovely messages, everybody. Um, as I say, I'll always be in the background. I'm a PPT patient. And uh, uh, I've got a lovely message from my own consultant, David Neil Finlayson, who said to me, it's quite amazing that one of my PPC patients has done more for PPC than I ever did as a hepatologist before I retired. Anyway, it was a lovely message. So I think you, you I mean, this, this before this becomes a sort of love in for it. it <laughs> um, I think <clears throat> what this is an example of is rolling your sleeves up and, and doing it and not waiting for permission or waiting for approval or, yeah. you know, ultimately, you know, you, um, it, it was a need. And it, you know, so if, if somebody, somebody needs to do it and why not you? And, and, and actually, you know, people forget the 25 years of the foundation. And um, it was a very different world at the beginning of this. This is now normal. You know, this is mainstream. You know, this is absolutely what is nationally encouraged and supported. But it wasn't then. And I think you, your the, the things that you've done, uh, this is going to sound creepy, isn't it? But the things that you've done for the PVC patients, but you've also done that for a very large number of other people because a lot of people have emulated the approach and the model and the, just the value of it. And so there are lots of people who've benefited from what you've done who don't even know about PVC because actually people have seen it can be done, it can be effective. Um, and it really works when it's a partnership. That's when it works. So, you know, 100%. When, it, when 100%. we're all working together yeah. on the same page, that's when it, it really works. And actually sometimes you get patient groups and the doctors and nurses are kind of polarised and don't get on with each other. Yeah, we, we've been so lucky that we've yeah. never had that. No, we're not doctor bashers, but apparently I'm told I'm a difficult woman to say no to. <laughs> anyway, I've been, I've enjoyed it. I just, I look back with immense pride, and the doctors bought into what we were doing, and we're all good pals, and we, we get on together, and we appreciate our own uh, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I, Colette will. Uh, she is one of the very few people who can phone me on a Sunday, and I'll pick up. You did, yeah. Very tearful me and David. Was I'll, I'll the bread and foster. <laughs> no, well, exactly. Um, you, you're only you're second only to Roger Williams. Somebody uh, will be familiar with Roger Williams, um, and uh, he was the you know the doyen of hepatology yeah. and a genuinely scary individual. Um, and somebody pointed out, as I did some research them a, a while, you know, years and years ago. Somebody pointed out to me every time he phoned up, I stood up. Um, I automatically stood up to take the phone call. So, <laughs> Colette, I don't stand. I, I don't normally stand up. Um, um, but, but you're second only. You always get the, me to answer. Um, but I don't stand up. So you're kind of just slightly below Roger. Well, Williams. I feel honoured and privileged. I've, I tell you, it's just amazing what I've achieved. Um, unfortunately, next week, Dr. Gideon Hirschfield is unable to make it um, to uh, something unavoidable. So we won't have a two o'clock session next week, but we'll be back the following week with Professor Newberger and in more news of uh, hopefully um, how things are standing with the Foundation. So, David, thank you very, very much for your yep, time. You. Um, I'm in Northumberland in June. I might catch you for a coffee. Excellent. Where are you going to? <laughs> um, as always, Almouse. Well, for the last time, actually, the house is being sold. We're going to Almouse. Very nice. Uh, which is lovely. Alan, Linda in the background. Chris is on holiday. Thank you, everybody, very, very much. I'm now going to walk my dog. Move Love the session. session. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dave. Afternoon. Bye. Bye, Bye just now.